That's good. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, you turn to the book of Zechariah with me this morning, please. Chapter number 4. Zechariah chapter 4. And verse number 1. Zechariah is the last book before the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter number 4 and verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and walked and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said to me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said to me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace, unto it. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The book of Zechariah is what's called a post-exilic book, after the exile. Israel experienced a lot of opposition coming back to their land. They opposed the building of the wall. They opposed the building of the temple. They opposed the restoration of the priesthood. They found opposition in every way possible. And so the Lord gave Zechariah a vision and encouraged them to understand that not by their power nor numbers, for Israel was outnumbered, outgunned, but by His Spirit. He would accomplish what he intended to do in restoring Israel to their land. By an invisible being that cannot be seen, I will restore you to your land. By an invisible being that's hardly understood, I will restore you unto your land. The Bible said in Luke chapter number 1 verse 17, He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He, of course, is John the Baptist. Luke chapter 4, verse 14 says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of Him through all the region round about. Romans 1, 4, the Bible said, And declared to me the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Romans 15 verse 19 said, Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And 1 Corinthians 2, 4, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. 1 Corinthians 5, 4, the Scripture says, In the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in 2 Timothy 1, 7, the divine text says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is only a sampling of the scripture that makes direct reference to the power of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. The power of the Spirit can be defined thusly. In the book of Luke chapter number 9 and verse number 1, it is defined with authority. He called His twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Therefore, the power of the Spirit of God is authority. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 10, the power of the Spirit of God also encompasses Discernment. 
to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So therefore the power of the Spirit of God is to walk in discernment. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 30, to walk in the power of the Spirit of God, but of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. When the Lord Jesus Christ walked out of that wilderness in the power of the Spirit of God, He walked in authority. He walked in discernment. He walked in wisdom. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 8, he also walked in sufficiency. For the Bible said, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. He calls you. He equips you. He speaks to your soul. He prepares you with an immeasurable amount of ability by and through the Spirit of the living God. In the book of Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 36, to be walking in the power of the Spirit of God is to walk in authority. It's to walk in discernment. It's to walk in wisdom. It's to walk in all sufficiency. And it is to walk in knowledge of the source of that. For in verse number 36 of Romans chapter number 11 it says, For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. My heart ticks because He tells it to tick. I breathe because He tells me to breathe. I live because He lives. Hallelujah to God. I exist because He exists. I am because He is. There is nothing higher than Him. There is no mind greater than His. It is by His sovereign grace, His sovereign will, His sovereign might that I stand before you this morning. I owe Him for everything I am or ever hope to be. When the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty, manifest in flesh, was about to enter in upon His earthly ministry, He would not set foot out of that place until He had walked in the endowment of the power of Almighty God. And that power can only come one way. It comes by the Spirit of the living God. For us to be acquainted with the Holy Spirit is wisdom. For us to understand the workings of the Spirit of God is the great truth that we cannot, my friend, desert. We cannot pass it by. We must build our lives completely on what we understand by the Spirit of God. The Apostle Paul said clearly, I did not come to you with wisdom of this world, with mighty words and mighty deeds, to try to impress you in any matter. He said, I came to you in the demonstration of the Spirit of the living God and of power. In plainer words, when the Holy Spirit is present, there is power. When the Holy Spirit, my friend, is manifested, there is power. Without the Holy Spirit of God, it is all a man-made sham. It is an empty profession. It is a well without water. It is, my friend, a dead deadness that is twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Therefore, we should desire that power of the Holy Spirit of God more than anything as Christians to understand what that's all about. There are some hindrances in the Bible, hindrances to the power of God, to the power of the Spirit. One would be self, self in the sense of timidity, men pleasers, peer pressure, what others may say about you. You don't want to be branded. You want somebody to think you're a fanatic. So therefore you cower under to what men have to say. Men, my dear friend, will never be able to go with you where God alone can go. Men will never be able to do for you what God alone can do. Men will never be able to lift that burden of sin from your soul. What God God alone can do. Cast aside your fear of man. Cast aside what men say about you and what they think about you. I care for nothing but what God says and what God does in my life this day. That's all that is worthy to live for Him, breathe for Him, preach for Him, talk for Him. It's for the Lord God Almighty. 
The Apostle Paul said, To me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's not earthly wisdom. That's not fleshly wisdom. That doesn't come by psychology. That comes by the revelation of God. Hindrances to the power of God would be self. Timidity, men pleasers, peer pressure, and hindrances to the power of the Spirit of God is also confusion. God is not the author of confusion. A single eye can serve God. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you want to serve the Lord Christ, set your mind on Him. Focus upon Him. Think on these things. Meditate about Him. He is the source of your life. He's what this life is all about. I was put here not for me I was put here to glorify God a hindrance to the power of the Spirit of God is the wisdom of this world there are those who think this world knows what it's talking about they think this world is wise they think this world is the source of wisdom this world my friend is rocking and reeling in ignorance and spiraling downward into damnation and you can see it everywhere you turn this world is ignorant because they're ignorant of God. True wisdom is the knowledge of God. True understanding is the knowledge of His will. And if you don't know the Lord and don't understand God and His will in your life, then you're walking in pure darkness. To turn away from God is to turn into darkness and into ignorance. So therefore, a hindrance to the power of God, you're listening to men. Turn men off. Open your Bible. Start reading the Word of God. Get on your knees and cry out to him that is able to answer you publicly when you pray, pray, pray privately. A hindrance to the power of God or the power of the Spirit of God in your life is self-reliance. All of this garbage about self, self-empowerment, self this, self that. Self is the problem. I am my problem. I am my worst enemy. It's not about me. It's about Him. You can always tell when your spiritual focus is right for you begin to focus on Christ and His glory. Christ and His goodness. Christ and His exaltation. He's a wonderful God. The Lord Jesus Christ is unmatched by any. He's one of a kind. There's not another like Him. And He's exalted to the right hand of the Father. Even His name has the power to cast out devils. Even His name can heal the sick and raise the dead. Even His name... There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. For it's a name that is above every name. My friend, the wisdom of this world will turn you into ignorance. Self-reliance. Self is the fertile ground of satanic deception. If you focus upon self, then you can't be focusing upon Christ. The Holy Spirit in comparison to the Godhead is what's so needful to understand. All things originate from the Father. Everything comes forth from the Father. Nothing can exist outside of the Father. You need to understand that of Him, to Him, through Him, and by Him are all things. He is the very source of everything that can be. If God Almighty chose, all of creation would cease to exist in a moment of time. But He wouldn't change one bit. By sons of Israel, you're not to consume because he changes not he is from everlasting to everlasting therefore from God the Father issues forth a will from God the Father issues forth a purpose then God the Son is the one who does it by him were all things made that were made the Lord Jesus Christ becomes the creator of everything there is by the will of the Father through the Son everything is made that is made and it is made for the glory of the Son for the Bible said but they were made by him and for him the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary being the will of the Father but it was at the cross at Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished our salvation, but he could only do it by the power of the Spirit of God. For the Bible said through the everlasting Spirit, he offered himself without spot to God. So therefore the Spirit is the very agency that enables the power of God to be manifested. If you can't see the working of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost in that, you don't understand the working of God in mankind from the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. 
Everything he did on this earth, he did it by the power of the Spirit of the living God. Everything. His life from the moment that he came into this world until he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit was one complete solemn dedication to the will of God the Father. And so my friend, the Holy Spirit, now my friend, the Holy Son and the Holy Father that make up the Trinity have to do everything with all that we understand that there must be. But we must discern the spirits in order for us as mere human beings, I'm just a man. I'm not an angel. I'm not a cherubim. I'm not a seraphim. I don't have extraterrestrial knowledge. I don't have some great understanding that someone else may say that they have. Everything that I understand about God, I understand about Him from His Word, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Let me give you four big things this morning. And these will help you because you're like me. You're a human being in flesh walking on this earth. We must discern the spirits. If we're going to walk in the power of the Spirit of God, we better know what spirit we're in. It is absolutely essential for us to know what spirit we're walking in and what spirit we have. Number one, in Third John chapter number one in verse number nine, there is a spirit here. And I'm using these as broad categories because there are many other things that could be subcategorized to what I'm talking about. In Third John chapter number one and verse uh, Third John one nine, we read these words. Third John one nine, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, printing against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Diotrephes is in every church. He's everywhere. He's all over the place. Say, so who is it, preacher? It's a malicious spirit. Malicious means that he desires your harm. Malice means that he wants to hurt you. He may appear as pious. He may come across, he may come across as a sweet, sweet Christian till he gains the position where he can harm you. You need discernment, dear Christian friend, of what goes on around you in the house of God. For that malice is here. It's there. It's everywhere. And be not, be not, don't be a sheep. Don't be ignorant. Don't be stupid. When it comes to dealing with these spirits, discern them. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he went into his earthly ministry, they would come to him and say, Master, Rabbi, Teacher, uh, what do you say about this? And when he answered them, he answered that malicious spirit in them. He never committed himself to them, for he knew they were devils coming in the appearance uh, with sheep's clothing. Then in 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 1, there is a deceiving spirit. Remember, these are broad categories. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. A seducing spirit is what seduced Eve in the garden. What is a seducing spirit, preacher? It is a religious spirit. It is wholly given to religion. It knows all the talk, all the words. It knows everything to say, when to say it, how to say it. And its purpose is to win you over, to convert you, to make a disciple out of you. Dear Christian friend, don't be fooled by smooth words. Don't be fooled by fair speeches. Don't be fooled by that one that would come across to you as a friend as a dear one that loves you. If you're going to discern the spirits, you're going to know what malice is. When you see malice begin to work and destroy the lives of people. And malice will never be satisfied until it has hurt someone. And my friend, if you're going to have discernment, you're going to know a spirit that tries to woo you over to its side and pull you out of the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here, now, here's another broad category. And it is this spirit in the book of Proverbs chapter 18. 
and verse number 14. In Proverbs 18, verse 14, here's what it says. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? If you go into my office and open up this uh, this uh, armoire inside this office, you will find that scripture written inside a door. I wrote that down years ago when I knew that my spirit had been wounded. I knew that I had been hurt deeply in my soul. It has taken God a long time to restore this preacher. How far he has restored me, I don't know. But I do know this. I no longer go into my prayer closet and spend half my time crying. I go in there and I pray. And I cry out to God. But there was a time when my spirit had been wounded. And when my spirit was wounded, I was like a fallen soldier on the field. Someone had to come and carry me. For I wasn't able to go on my own. That wounded spirit, my dear friend, can come to you when you least expect it. And it may come to you through someone you least expect it to come. It may be through a series of circumstances that culminate in some tragedy in your life. It may be some trusted friend that turns on you. It may be a husband or a wife that violates the, 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 the marriage vow. It may come in all kinds of ways. But when it does come, and your spirit is wounded, then you'll begin to understand what sustains you. For the Bible says right here that the spirit of a man sustains him. That's what lifts you up. That's what gives you life. That's what gets you going day by day is that spirit that lives within you. That's your inspiration. That's your joy. That's your power. That's your walk with God. And Satan will go, my friend, to the jugular in a heartbeat. And if he can wound your spirit, we're not talking about somebody backslidden, as the old classic saying, where you've fallen into sin. And these things happen to people. Galatians 6 talks clearly about a brother that's fallen. This is not what it's talking about. It's talking about somebody who more than likely was doing everything right. And then the wrong came into their life. And wounded their spirit. Now, I'm going to tell you something in a minute about how to deal with this, all right? If you'll listen to me, it'll be the kind of thing that can help you. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, I can't quit without mentioning this spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 8, the Bible said, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man but God, who also, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Oh boy. <laughs> I can't tell you what that's like. You just have to know. You have to know the Holy Ghost. How do you know him, preacher, with your sins have been forgiven? And that burden of hell has been lifted off your soul. That's a good sign. If your life has drastically changed somewhere along the way and men and women can't understand what happened to you, that's a good indication. And if you've got a spiritual hunger for God and His Word and you want to walk with Him and talk to Him and come to the house of God, that's a good indication that the Holy Ghost has moved in and when you're darkness and alone and there's nobody around and there's nobody impressed and nobody's watching and your mind settles on the Lord and you begin to talk to Him and then you begin to praise Him and you start worshiping Him. That's a good sign that the Holy Ghost has moved in your soul. That's a good sign. Good sign. Now what I'm going to talk to you is about spiritual warfare. Because it's not a game we're playing. And it's not about a prayer you pray. You think by praying a prayer, everything's going to change. I don't want to change anything. I want to get your attention, okay? Just because you prayed a prayer doesn't change anything. And just because somebody prayed with you, that doesn't either. But let me tell you what does change. This is what changes. A week ago, Saturday, 
about 11.30 in the morning, my wife fell off of a third step up going upstairs, about six to eight feet backwards, and she fell a long way. She could have easily broken her neck, been paralyzed, snapped her spine, and died right on the spot. I was outside and heard her hit the floor. It was a thump. And then as I came through the door, I heard her screaming. She was screaming for me, and I ran up to her side. For seven hours, she laid there, hoping she'd get better. As long as she laid still, she's okay. If she moves, she screams in pain, horrible pain. About 6 o'clock Saturday afternoon, I said, Look, you're not going to get any better, and I'm going to call ambulance, and we're taking you to the hospital. And she agreed. Finally, she agreed. We took her to the hospital. That night in the emergency room, they took x-rays, came back about 12, 11, 30, 12 o'clock midnight, Saturday night. Doctor looked at her and said, you've got a broken hip, and you're going to have to have surgery. And so 2.30 that morning, they checked us into the room at, Saint, at the UT Hospital, 2.30 Sunday morning, checked into the room, 9 o'clock, they came and got her. And about 11 o'clock, 10.45, 11, they called back in the waiting room and said, she's in surgery now. So about the time you all were having church last Sunday morning, she was in surgery. That was fast. I thanked God. Thank you, Lord. She didn't die. Thank you, Lord. It just kept coming to me. Thank you, Lord. She didn't die. She didn't die. Would you please listen to what I'm about to tell you now? Would you please listen? And then about a day or two later, I felt resentment coming up inside me. Resentment. I felt it. I felt it start to rise up in my soul. Resentment. Why'd this happen? I'm trying to serve you. Why's my wife laying flat on her back over here at UT Hospital? Why's she going through all this pain? Resentment. Resentment. I didn't like it a bit. Now, I don't know if you've been listening to preachers that shout hallelujah every time something happens, but I'm a real person. And buddy, when she was laying flat on that floor, I didn't like it a bit. I didn't like it when she was laying flat on her back in the hospital. I didn't like it. I didn't like it a bit. Didn't like it. And I felt resentment. So what would you do, preacher? I went to war. What would you do? I went home. I went into my room. And I shut the door. I went in there to do business with God. I got on my face. I got down there and I buried my face in the carpet. And here's what I said. I said, Lord, you know how I feel. You know what's coming up inside me. And I don't want this. Amen. So I began to pray. I began to pour my heart out to him and say, God, there's nowhere to go. If I turn on you and turn away here, i got nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. Nowhere. There's nowhere. You've been good to me, Lord. She could have died. You've been good to me. Up until that point now, everybody's following me, got no problem. And then this is what I did. I turned to that spirit that was rising up inside me because that's a spirit. And I said, the Lord rebuke you, rebel. The Lord rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I come against you in the name of Christ and plead his blood against you, you lying devil. Because you're trying to separate me from my God. You're trying to drive a wedge into my life. Yes. The Lord spared her. And so Satan, devil, demon, whatever you are, the Lord rebuke you. Yes, Get thee hence. And I felt it leave the room. I came out of my prayer closet. And it has not come back since. That's the warfare that some of you need to fight. Because you're giving place to the devil. Something's happened in your life. You're letting him take hold. You're starting to reason with God. Instead of coming as a little child in simple faith and saying, Lord, here I am. Don't understand it, but you're still God. You're still God. You're still God. Come to him and then confront that spirit. That's where my dear Baptist brothers have failed so much. There seems to be some kind of a blockage. When it comes to the confrontation that must take place, spirits are intelligent beings. 
They're intelligent. And they will take command of your life if you let them. And the only weapon you have, and it is only, it's all, it's good, it's good enough. Is the name of Jesus and the blood of Christ. And plead it. And I can't explain to you, you don't know what goes on inside my heart. But folks, that resentment is gone. And it didn't happen up here. It happened when I confronted that spirit. And it left. Because I'm a believer. Paul I know and Peter I know and Christ I know. But who are you? Those demons said to the seven sons of Sceva. So if you know the Lord, then you have that authority. And she's doing better. God's taught me a lot of things since I have to do a lot of things. But I don't, I don't mind it. The fact is, I'm, a lot of things I enjoy. And she's starting to get a little ornery, which is a good sign. Amen. <laughs> she's getting better. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, I told him the truth, Lord. I told him about the real world and the real battle. And there's some folk in here this morning, Lord, and maybe listening to this thing, may watch it later. They're going through a battle like that. May they break that ice. May they cross that. May they do it for the first time. May they confront that spirit. And in the name of Jesus, drive it out. And give them victory. In thy sweet holy name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up, brother. What have we got? Page 137 in your altar. 137. Come. Did you come? The truth will make you free. You come. The Holy Ghost is in this house. That's a mark of the Holy Spirit right there. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. That's a mark of the Holy Ghost. Don't you come. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Hallelujah to his holy name. Won't you come? Won't you come? What's your name? She'll get your name when she comes down. She'll be down here in a second, okay? She'll come right down. Jesus, hallelujah. as they come. You don't fight tomorrow's battles today. You fight today's battles today. So I pray this lady right here. Y'all pray with me. Thank you. Thank you. Sufficient to the days, the evil thereof, the Bible says. There's enough evil for today. You don't have to live but tomorrow's evil. You don't fight tomorrow's battles. You fight them one at a time. But you fight them, folks. You got to fight them. You got to go into that battle equipped.
You got to go into it conscious. You got to go in and understand who your enemy is. And you got to go into it knowing the battle's already won. The victory's already yours. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> yes. Victory's won, folks. <laughs> he made a show of them openly, the Bible says. Triumphed over them. Your enemy's strong, but the Lord Christ is stronger. Bless the name of Jesus. Bless that holy name. There's no name like Jesus. No. I've been to places that a human being can't go, but he's been there. He's been there. Always faithful. Always faithful. Always. face sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Hard hearts. Oh boy. If something like this happens to you now in the next few weeks, few months, remember what this preacher told you. I don't live in a castle in the sky somewhere in some la la make believe land. I live in the real world. And I have real feelings like everybody else does. And sometimes I get aggravated and agitated. But it forces me to turn to him. And then I learned something about him. I learned something about him. You pray prayers and prayers sound good. And when you pray these prayers, sometimes you don't really think about how God's going to answer that prayer. He may answer that prayer in an entirely different way than you ever imagined. And he has a way when he does it to call to your remembrance. <laughs> it blows my mind <laughs> how he'll call to my remembrance a prayer that I prayed. And say, this is the answer, son. This is the way I'm going to do it. <laughs> well, he's God. I don't make that choice. That's what sovereignty means. He's the Lord. He answers to no court, no judge, no state, nobody. <laughs> he's God. He answers to righteousness and holiness. <laughs> you can't do wrong. All right. Well, thank you, folks. Pray for this young, pray for this lady down here right now. Amen. What about this young man? Prayed a minute ago. 